Ew, ruler of nerds here, and let's hop into Pester Quest. So we are on volume two, something beyond the sky. On the advice of your new friend John, you go to visit one of his close comrades. Close only figuratively speaking, since it seems she lives all the way on the other side of the country. That's no problem for you, though, since your new powers let you hop anywhere, anytime, even to places that don't exist. Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, you think your power let you do that? You just have this distinct metatextual feeling that you could pretty much go anywhere at this point. You know that doesn't make any sense. There is nothing that doesn't make sense about your friendship, though. And that's exactly what you're about to do. Friendship, that is. You're about to do some friendship by making a new friend. Her name is... You check your notes. Rose. This is her house, apparently. It looks kind of weird and modern. And it's situated in the middle of the woods for no good reason you can think of. Also, it's pouring rain, which is not what you would describe as an ideal friend-making conditions. Still, nothing stops a mailman, not from delivering mail nor making friends. Rather famously, rain and other similar weather patterns provide no deterrent to the performance of his duty. And there is no duty more important than friendship. Except for maybe surviving, but eh, uh, his backseat. Suddenly a woodland girl approaches. Who goes there? Oh, it's your new friend Rose, obviously. There is literally no one else this could be. You introduce yourself. You are the very cool mailman who John told her to expect a visit from soon. You would doff your mail hat to signal a friendly greeting, except recently you accidentally dropped it into a sewer, along with all your other mail-specific clothes, as well as all the mail you were supposed to deliver, as you explained to her gratuitously, in an unconvincing manner. It's not a great start, you admit, but you've done much worse. You are not a mailman. Yikes, you are busted almost immediately. You briefly consider whether you should double down on the lie and try to say something mailman-like, or whether the right call is to come clean, since she's clearly too smart for this amateur bullshit. But it's taking a few seconds too long for you to decide, which looks guilty as hell. That's it. The jig is up. You slouch in defeat. You ask her if she would please consider not telling John. Your heart couldn't take it if you found out your entire friendship was based on a lie. You want me to keep a secret from one of my best friends to protect the feelings of random buffoon who I've never met, and arbitrarily showed up to my house in the remote wilderness like a creep. No, yes, yes. <laughs> um, yes, that's what you want. It's an interesting proposition, if for no other reason than its audacity. I admire your resolve in the face of humiliation. This doesn't mean we're friends, though. Oof, rough. Well, that's fine. You're helpful. Your mind is fuzzy, but you think you remember this. You're good at this. You are excellent at making people like you through underheaded means. You can't wait to take advantage of this 13-year-old girl's goodwill. That does not sound appropriate. Okay, well, not like that. Let's not be fucking weird. Exactly. <laughs> In fact, let that be the last creepy thought you have for comical purposes. S-grade jokes only. Let's all get our brains out of the gutter. Please and thank you. Rose raises a thin eyebrow. There's something unsettling about her deep violet eyes. You're pretty sure most humans don't have eyes like that, but what the fuck do you know? You're a stranger around these parts. Wait, aren't you a human too? Doesn't look like it, buddy. Whatever. It's not a big deal. Not when there are friends to be made. Also, okay, I thought for a moment the music stopped and I was like, that's a creepy moment to pause it. Or something. Do you want to come inside? Unless I'm interrupting your internal monologue, of course. 
Far be it from me to ever cut short any sort of navel-gazing sidebar. It's just ever so slightly wet out here. <laughs> you would absolutely love that if it's not too much of trouble, of course. You wouldn't want to put Rose out. You're lying, though. You're 100% fine with being absolutely infuriatingly obnoxious if it means making a friend. <laughs> Rose purses her lips, considering. Your predilections toward mailman mimicry weren't all that John told me about. Oh? He also said that you had... certain powers. Powers of teleportation and time travel. I told him that he must be mistaken since it's a well-known and accepted fact that magic, although a popular and highly engaging subject of fiction, is fake as hell. Oh, your zappy powers? No, those are totally real and not fake. Real in a different way than you being a mailman is real, since that is actually made up. Is that so? Prove it. You shrug, easy enough. You hold out a hand, and after a moment of hesitation, Rose puts her fingers in yours. Her nails are long and sharp and painted a glossy black. She closes her eyes, and her umbrella droops. Ah. Should I picture my room, or something similar? I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to work. She still thinks you're fucking with her. You tell her that you guess she can do that if she wants. You zap the two of you inside the big modern house, and then when you open your eyes, you find yourself in a large, messy bedroom. Oh. She drops her umbrella. You... You really did that. Rose stands in the center of her room in full rain gear. Her boots track muddy prints into the thick white carpet. Surprise, you really are magic. Rose puts a small hand against her perfectly painted black lips. She seems momentarily lost for words. And you get the feeling that is not a thing that happens very often. Her eyes are wide and deeply purple. They're sparkling, you might even say. Hold on, I'll be right back. Stay here. Don't go out into the hall. It's not... It's not safe. You tell Rose to take her time. You're happy to just stand here dripping into the nice, clean floor. She leaves the room and you take the opportunity to examine your surroundings a little more closely. The bed is unmade. Books are strewn over the floor carelessly, and a collection of half-drunk cups of coffee crowd the desk. <laughs> Half-finished knitting projects lie in soft piles all over the room. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that this room is often occupied by someone with a lot of interests who has trouble settling down and putting her attention to one thing at a time. Big mood! <laughs> Man, you relate. Not with the interest, but with friends. <laughs> you can't imagine settling for just one. Rose has a number of posters on her walls, although nowhere near as many as your friend John. A calendar hangs beside the window, days ticked off with little X's, all the way up to 413, which is circled. Nice. You step closer to read the year date up in the corner. 2009. What the hell do you care about that date? You can just make friends any day of the damn week, rain or shine, night or day. Sure. Rose is taking a while out there. She told you that it wasn't safe out in the hall. Maybe she hadn't just been quipping. Maybe she's actually in trouble. What should you do? Go look for her. Stay put. I'm going to listen to her and I'm going to stay put. Your patience pays off almost at once. Rose is back and looking significantly more put together. Also, she's brought you a towel. Here. I'm not overly attached to anything in here. It's mostly just childish nonsense I haven't yet bothered to rid myself of. But I'd appreciate it if you tried not to trip on any of the notebooks. She has changed out of her raincoat and boots. And she's dressed in a neat black skirt and a white shirt with a purple blob thing with tentacles. What is it with these kids in their blob shirts? Now that's dealt with, please sit down. 
She crosses her legs. You suddenly feel like you're at a job interview. Friend interview. You wish you were a little less damp. Actually, let's switch places. Oh, uh, you're still pretty wet. You don't want to get her bedspread messed up. Don't worry about it. That's what washing machines are for. Now, let's talk about magic. Which, up until now, I have always taken for granted as being something confined to storybooks. Rose takes a wistful look toward her bedroom window, grayed over and blurry with raindrops. You get the feeling that she's doing it for effect. Maybe that's why she wanted you to switch places with her. <laughs> and then comes you. The not a mailman with a penchant for showing up and attempting to make friends with unwitting children. Well, fair, she's got you there. But honestly, she might be a child, but she really doesn't seem to be unwitting. On the contrary, she's really quite witty. Witty. I'm glad you noticed. She folds her hands and clears her throat. You think that if she had any notes, she would be shuffling them. <laughs> And so the question remains, are you a good witch, or a bad witch, or are you a wizard? We've already established that you are not a public servant. Is there a difference between a witch and a wizard? Of course there is, but exactly how specific of a difference can vary. According to some works of fiction, a wizard is just a witch's male counterpart. But in certain mythologies, for instance, Arthurian, legend, the difference appears to be class-based. Wizards reside at court and are classically trained, while witches are self-taught and run wild through the forest. I won't deny that those differences tend to often be gendered as well. You ask her which one she is, a witch or a wizard. Me? Rose shifts in crossing and recrossing her legs. You shrug and say she just seems to know a lot about them. I know a thing or two. From fan fiction? <laughs> but can I tell you a secret? Oh my god, Rose. She has no idea how much you would love to hear her secret. <laughs> I find them, wizards, I mean, utterly reprehensible. They disgust me. Everything from their foppish robes to their grizzled beards. It's my mother who is the wizard enthusiast in this house. Although... She glances from side to side theatrically. Most of the things Rose does seem to be at least a little bit theatrical. She kneels on the carpet beside the clutter of books. I don't show these to many people. Actually, I haven't shown them to anyone. Not even John. John seemed to be a pretty cool guy. Definitely a guy worth sharing a few secret notebooks with. Rose laughs. No, I haven't shown them to John. <laughs> and I've only shown Strider to punish him. You nod, pretending that you know who this Strider person is. It's Dave, the one who uh, approved us. You are a totally no normal dude with an absolutely ungodly number of friends. A shadow moves through the center of you. A trembling moment of deja vu. You... You do have a lot of friends, don't you? That feels true, but the only people you know here are John and now Rose. Weird. Ah, uh, we forgot our friends. Uh. You try to put it from your mind and listen to Rose again. She's still talking about this mysterious strider, flipping through one of the journals too quickly for you to see anything specific, only that it is full from cover to cover. As if my modest writings are the sole source of homoerotic tension in my life, when his brother is the one who insists on filling their home with assorted dick butts for ironic purposes. <laughs> Rose rolls her eyes. Oh boy, you missed the beginning of that. It probably made way more sense than it seemed like. Rose is searching through notebooks, checking markings on the spine that seemed to be some sort of cataloging system of arcane symbols. There is... oh, right. 
she does something quick and complex with her fingers, and another notebook pops into existence and falls into her lap. You gape. She really is a wizard! What? It's just a Skilladex. A child could use one. Here. This notebook has a couple of drawings in it, but most of it is filled with small, neat handwriting in lavender ink. Is Rose writing a book? No, don't be silly. I'm writing four books, at least. <laughs> Five, depending on whether I decide to flesh out Calamasis's backstory. It isn't strictly necessary, but it does add a certain amount of valuable character insight, which renders their actions in later volumes more sympathetic. Not that I need all of my anti-heroes to be sympathetic. I'm just thinking of what the literary reviewers would say. You nod smart. You would never have thought of what the literary reviewers would say. She is honestly pretty impressive for someone her age. Age has nothing to do with it. But don't get carried away. It's only a rough draft. You ask her if you can take a look. She hesitates, but you doubt she would have shown it to you if she didn't want you to look. What the hell? If you can't trust a stranger's spherical imprint you met outside in the rain, who can you trust? Right. Your thoughts exactly. Rose hands you the notebook and you open it at random, letting fate guide your hand. Friglish bothered his bread as if unkinking a hitch in a long silk windsock. A more pedestrian audience would sparse the exhibit as nervous compulsion behavior to petition contempt among the reasonable. He was, however, not surrounded by the reasonable, but the wise, a distinction in men that would forever be the difference in history's garland of treasured follies. As a matter of fact, his cadre of fellow wizards, all putting similar moves on their beards as well. The practice would evince thoughtfulness, Saga City, even, if they didn't do it all the time. Standing in line at the bank, shooing squirrels from their bird feeders, few occasions were safe. Zazerpan expected the clue, a single piece of evidence cradled in his coracious old man palms. It was a human bone, not striking in the tale it told, alone, so much so that told by the thousands like it, thus tuning the marshy soil of the mass grave. The grisly expanse bore the texture of a dissident desert, like one of Smarney's formidable custard truffles wobbled out on wheels for the holidays, to the dismay of a small nation. You're certain of this? asked Frigglish. Despite what he was doing with his beard, he was, in fact, immersed in meaningful contemplation. I'm afraid I am becoming more so with each terrible tick groused by the gaudy timepiece slung around your neck. In case it wasn't clear, Frigglish were a clock Zazerpan didn't care for. It was magic. The massacre of Sir Gnef was not as written. Well, this is... Pretty dense, but smart. You stroke your own imaginary beard and pretend to ponder the deeper meaning. Hmm, yes, intriguing. Zazapan and Frigglish. Clearly there was some history there. Yes, clearly, but what the two of them shared went beyond simple romance. That's why it has gone so spectacularly sour. Rose becomes increasingly more animated as she tells you about her gay wizard OCs. She is far more interested in them than she is in herself. <laughs> they share an intellectual bond, a mutual dedication to knowledge and the preservation of such. The goal of the learned is to amass their wisdom and keep it from the general dissemination into the main populace of wizards. They feed it to their apprentices in drips and drabs. Of course, this will eventually lead to ruin. Of course, you flip further into the book, searching for the part where it leads to ruin. Ruin sounds interesting. Sazerpan knew he would see his wayward apprentice again. Knew it like he knew the tide would turn and the sun would blaze into its zenith as each inexplorable day passed. 
Now they stood, diametrically opposed, across an overgrown chessboard. His apprentice's eyes were hidden behind dark glasses, but Cezapan knew that if he could see them, they would be riddled with the madness of the void. Kalamasis wasn't here for justice or for revenge. They were here exclusively because Zazapan had something they wanted, something they were owed. You flip through the notebook, checking out the drawings. There were a lot of wizards, each more bearded and venerable than the last. One of the pictures, the most recent maybe, since it's on the very last page of the journal, is the two young wizards. Twins, maybe. They have gray hair, and they are wearing slick green suits. They are standing back to back with their arms intertwined, staring into the middle distance. It's very anime. You compliment Rose on her artistic prowess. Yes, thank you. They're all right. I'm much better writer than I am an artist. <laughs> You tell her you think she's really good, way better than you. You're absolutely positive she is going to be famous one day. I appreciate the encouragement, even though I know you're just trying to flatter me, due to your strange thirst for affirmative experiences. John told me all about that. Damn busted. You really do think she's talented. It's fine. It's not as if my social calendar is over full out here in the middle of the woods. Don't tell anyone I said that I don't have many friends. And don't tell them I've been drawing. He'd be insufferable. He? Never mind. You assure Rose that her secrets are safe and hand back her journal. You are really excited about your new friend, if you might be so bold and her wizard stories, although, wait, hadn't she said that she hated wizards? What's your point? Well, you're no expert on wizards or on Rose, but it seems like she actually does seem to like them, because she has several notebooks full of wizard fiction. You aren't trying to get, like, real here, but maybe it's possible her mom isn't the only one in the family who likes wizards. Rose pulls her book out of your hand. That and the rest of the books vanish into thin air. Oh, right, that must have been that, what'd she call it? Skeledex? She doesn't look angry exactly, but the lines around her mouth and eyes that soften as she talked about her book may have hardened back up. Her eyes glitter menacingly. Oh, is that right, Frude? Well... Why don't you diagnose me? Oh, hey, well, you weren't trying to be condescending or whatever. Clearly. Were you aware that it is a common psychological phenomenon for an individual to react to trauma by creating fictional representations that which has caused them bodily harm or emotional dismay? Wait, what? Really? To suggest that the portrayal of those fictional renderings somehow condones them, or supports them, is absolutely absurd. So she was saying that she draws wizards to cope? Rose rises regally to her feet. The lightning turns her into an ethereal silhouette. What I'm saying is that I don't need to justify my fictional predilections to you. Or to anyone else. No, no, she's totally right. You're sorry that you suggested she might like wizards. It was horribly presumptuous. And not at all the way a friend should act. So, you are so, so sorry. You promise it will never happen again. No, I don't suppose it will. It's probably just because Rose's hair is such a pale blonde. But it almost looks like she's glowing in the dim bedroom. Like light behaves a little differently around her than it does on everything else. Oh well. Would you look at that? It appears the rain has lightened up a bit. The rain is hitting the window so loudly you're actually having trouble hearing her. And your point is? You can just zap yourself out to where the weather is drier. Fuck off. 
Oh, okay, Rose. Wow. Go zap yourself. <laughs> nice. I'm gonna get the good ending first, so go look for her. You were too anxious to just sit still, and you aren't the sort of person who just sits there and waits for friend opportunities to fall in their lap. Better to run headlong into danger, or as much danger as a minimalist upper middle class house in the middle of woods can offer. Rose had told you that it isn't safe. You creep out into the hallway where a bunch of things happen more or less simultaneously. A dolge of quick time events that you had no idea were coming. Lightning flashes in a perfect jagged line across the tall window at the end of the hall, followed immediately by a crash of thunder so loud you think the house might be falling down. Abruptly all the lights go out. Oh no. Another flash of lightning and a vertiginous moment you see a long, thin figure superimposed against the window. Hi, Mom! You freak the fuck out, jumping about a foot in the air and yelling like a cat. A small hand lands on your shoulder and you jump again. Calm down, it's just me. Rose speaks in a normal tone of voice and it's jarring. The house is echoey and cavernous and there's just something about a dark house in a stormy evening that makes you want to whisper. I told you to stay put for a reason. It's too early for my mother to be sauced enough not to notice random strangers in the house, and I don't want to go through the tedious process of explaining who you are. You have a perfectly understandable reason for why you left, and that reason is that you were lonely. Oh wow. <laughs> Rose snorts. Cold! You mean you were cold. Well, you are soaking wet. Follow me. She grabs you by the wrist and tows you down the hall. You wonder if you should warn her about the strange, wraith-like creature you saw by the window, but you don't want to freak her out. Although her mom might be at risk, too. Whatever, moms are tough. She'll be fine. This probably isn't the first time she's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with a weird slender man. This house looks haunted as shit. Rose brings you to a dark laundry room, then motions you to take off your hoodie, which you do, gladly because it is soaking wet. That's interesting. Hmm. The design on the front, does it mean anything? Oh yeah, this is kind of cool. A blue line that zigzags on one end like lightning. Looking at it makes you feel unsettled. No, the boyfriend hoodie. <laughs> Malek, don't forget me. <laughs> you realize Rose is still waiting for your response. So you just hand her the hoodie and tell her no. You're pretty sure it's just an abstract sign. Then you stand there while she tosses the sweatshirt in the dryer. Feeling the alarming currents of memory in your bloodstream, you're sure there must be something you forgot to do. Go visit Malek. You continue to feel weird as Rose hits the dryer button and nothing happens. Well, yeah, the lights are off. What did you expect? Fuck. She hits the button a few more times as if that will make a bit of a difference when the power is out. She presses her thumb and forefinger to the bridge of her nose. Well, you aren't going to fit into anything of mine. She leads you down more long, dark hallways. Man, this house is unreasonably huge. You ask Rose if a lot of people live here. No, it's just me, my mother, and a hoard of liquids not suitable in water. Here, try not to drip on the carpet. You aren't sure how you're supposed to manage that, but okay. The room is large and dark, and when Rose parts the curtains, a flash of lightning illuminates a four-poster bed, a long counter, and a shelf covered head to foot in bottles of alcohol. Rose vanishes through another door, leaving you to, to peruse. This is... yep, this is all liquor. Shit, this is a lot of booze. Here. I'm not sure what you would want to wear, but this should work until the power comes back on and we can dry your clothes. 
Rose hands you a long silk robe. Oh, nice. She won't miss this. I don't think she's ever even worn it. She has this whole closet full of fantastic clothes that she never puts on. You take the robe and go into the large master bathroom. It's kind of a mess. The tub looks like it hasn't been cleaned in a long time. The robe gives you the exact same knotted feeling of familiarity that looking at your hoodie did, but you put it on anyway. It's a relief to get out of your wet clothes. You hang them carefully on the shower rod. Oh. <laughs> when you head back out into the bedroom, you find Rose standing in front of the wall of liquor. She's holding a bottle of Grey Goose and squinting at the label like she's trying to read the nutrition facts. <laughs> I've often wondered what exactly the merits of consuming this are. It tastes, quite literally, like burning. She opens the bottle, and before you can protest that she is in by no means the legal drinking agent, wherever the fuck you are, she puts the bottle to her mouth and takes a sip. She splutters. <laughs> Blah. That's terrible. You could have told her that. Straight vodka isn't for the uninitiated, even fancy vodka. You take the bottle from her. She hesitates for a moment, then lets it go. You set it back on the shelf. This really is, uh, quite an impressive liquor cabinet. Liquor wall. Liquor room. Her mom must really have a refined palate. Don't strain yourself. You can say it. What's the point of mincing words? She's a fucking alcoholic. Well, this is intense. You're not sure if you're prepared for something this heavy. You were kind of counting on some silly shenanigans, maybe a couple of funny jokes. You weren't cut out for this. You get the feeling that at some point you might have been cut out for this. You might have been the sort of person your friends, or potential friends, could count on. In fact, you know, on some level, that this is true, but whenever you try to nail down any sort of specifics, you find a gaping lacuna in your experiences. It's all just white noise. Rose's shoulders slump as she stands surveying her mother's bottles. <sighs> she doesn't even have the decency to hide her distasteful habits. Who needs an entire wall of liquor bottles? She doesn't have people over. She doesn't have any friends. This is all just for me. Just more of her passive-aggressive act as a femme fatale 1950s housewife with a death wish. It's just like the wizards. Wizards? Don't worry about it. You know how long it's been since I have had a home-cooked meal. And I'm not saying that I require, or even desire, a lovingly crafted culinary masterpiece every time I sit down to eat. That's going a bit far. I know John complains about being plagued by fatherly concern every chance he gets. He's just overwhelmed by pastries whenever he ventures from his room. I'm glad my mother doesn't poke her considerable nose into my private affairs. But I'm sick of eating oatmeal. Rose. I told you, don't worry about it. But you will worry about it. You worry about all your friends. All two of them. Rose smiles with half of her mouth. It seems to be about all she can manage. Lightning crashes. She looks so small and sad against this wall of bottles. You know how to fix this. Thunder rolls and you clench your fists. A friendship clench. You don't know who you are. You don't know why you're here. But you do know that, that surely you have these powers for a reason. And what better reason than helping a poor young girl with her troubled home life? Rolling up your floppy sleeves, you get to work. What are you doing? You start with the dark liquors first. In your experiences, those cause worse hangovers. What, what experiences? I'm not old enough to drink yet. And are more likely to contribute to the absence of hot 
motherly meals and the overconsumption of oatmeal. You grabbed two bottles of rum and then one of bourbon, which you took in one armpit. Then you zap out of the forest into a clearing in the nearby woods. A couple of hours ago, before it started raining, you drop the bottles and go back for more. Are you just stealing all of my mother's liquor? Is this your solution to her alcoholism? Don't you worry, Rose can thank you later. You go for the tequila next, then the vodka. Then you get sick of this organized approach and just start grabbing whatever the fuck and dumping it in the past. Rose watches you do this for a while, then she hops up on the counter, crosses her legs, and starts texting. <laughs> but she's just like, Hey John, wait. Hey John, your friend here is stealing my mother's liquor. <laughs> Well, she really is so intent on her conversation that she doesn't even notice you fixing her domestic situation. She keeps giving you little fleeting looks and you're pretty sure she must be talking about you. Yep, she's talking to John about this whole situation, probably. You should just let her talk. It isn't right to try and invade your friend's privacy. You attempt to resist the temptation, which you fail at immediately. Not even an overused meme can save you. You zip behind her, onto the counter where you can spy on her private correspondence. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I can't read both of them at the same time. I'm just going to read hers in her voice. I don't know anything about them. I'm sorry. Sigh. And here was me trying to take advantage of your uncanny ability to make guesses verging on prognostication. I'm recently considering a reevaluation on magic. Hmm, you don't know who this person is. Maybe you should just... You go back in time a couple of minutes to when Rose started her conversation. Your past self is busily zapping back and forth, carrying liquor bottles. You hunker down so you don't see yourself and cause a paradox or whatever the fuck. Tentacle therapist, TT, began pestering Garden Gnostic, GG. Out of morbid curiosity to shine a light on my future, I come with metaphorical hat in hand to ask you to consult your dream clouds. Do you happen to know anything about a strange cardboard cutout creature masquerading as a mailman? Hmm? Are you sleeping? I'm sorry, I just had to scroll back. He's been acting really weird all of a sudden. Anyways, is this the same mailman that John was talking about? The fake one who hung out with him? That's the one. They are currently emptying my mother's liquor cabinet in the attempt to prevent her from overindulging herself. Oh, are they drinking it? No, I think they are just dropping it into the woods with their magic powers. Oh, hmm. No, their voices are two the same. I, I can't do that. Do they know that she could just go out and buy more liquor? That's something you can do where you live, right? Yes, well, not exactly where we live. I think the nearest boozery is a good 20 minute drive. I'm not actually entirely sure where my mother got it all. We don't own a car, as far as I know. Sometimes it seems like she has the ability to just make things appear. I don't know anything about them. I'm sorry. And here was me trying to take advantage of your uncanny ability to make guesses verging on prognostication, as I am recently considering a re-evaluation on magic. I'm still pretty sure magic is fake, at least the kinds of magic you're talking about. There's probably some real magic out there somewhere. Yes, for instance, the sort that lets you spy on your hostess' private correspondence while you are stealing her mother's libations. You freeze. With a contrite zap, you reappear in front of Rose. She sets her phone down and props her chin up on a delicate fist. Sorry, you honestly don't know what got into you. You just couldn't resist using your power for evil. 
Haven't you ever heard that with great power comes great responsibility? Rose is right. She's totally right. You've only had this power for like a day. So you still aren't used to the idea of being able to just zap all over the narrative. Clearly you do not appreciate the implications. Zapping all over the narrative sounds potentially stressful. Oh, you bet! You are incredibly stressed right now! Rose laughs. You apologize to her for stealing all of her mom's drinks. That was kind of overzealous of you. No, actually, I thought it was hilarious. I've never really been one for pranks. That's always fallen more in John's wheelhouse, but there's nothing wrong in occasionally stepping outside of one's comfort zone. Let's do the vodka next. The two of you quickly working together gets the place cleared out pretty quick. You zap Rose along with you to the bright clearing in the field, and for a moment, she just stands in a sunbeam, blinking up the cloudless sky. Her expression says she still might not be totally convinced any of this is happening. When all of the liquor has been transferred from the bedroom to the woods in a big glittery dragon sword of booze, you and Rose fall down next to it in a messy heap. While well, you fall into a messy heap, Rose lowers herself daintily, sitting more on her knees than her butt, probably to keep her skirt from getting dirty. You get the idea that even though she lives in the middle of nowhere, she doesn't spend a ton of time outside. You tell her again that you're sorry you spied on her correspondence with her green friend Gigi. Also, you hope she isn't going to get in trouble with her mom. I'm not unduly concerned. I'll tell her where it all is in a couple of days. Although by that time, I'm sure at least a good third of it will be water damaged. I'm sure this will have fantastic implications for our relationship, and I'm not at all exacerbated the emotional problems underlying her addiction. You laugh awkwardly. Well, now you kind of just feel like an asshole. Rose lies back on the grass and raises a hand to trace the curve of a fluffy white cloud. She closes her eyes. Perhaps it's just projection on my part. Or wishful thinking. But ever since I met you, I feel like something has changed. Or rather, something has failed to change, if that makes any sense. It's probably nothing. No, it's something. We messed up the timeline. I'm sorry about that, Rose. Well, I saved a lot of people's lives in the long run, I think, so. Her eyes flicker back open. Endless purple fixed on the sky like she can see something beyond it. And once again, you feel that there's something really crucial that you forgot. But at least you've made a new friend, and even if you don't think Rose's brand would ever allow her to call you as such, you're lying in a sunny clearing next to a pile of alcohol, and honestly, it doesn't get much friendlier than that. <laughs> Victory. So now we're going to get the other ending. No! Don't lie for me. Man, you guess today is the day you get owned by teens. She is totally right. What are you doing just wandering up to her house without even calling first? It's just totally disrespectful of her time. No need to self-flagellate. It was a simple suggestion to more critically examine your motivations and actions in the future. No, no, she's right. You're going. You zap away, aiming for a spot a half mile away into the woods, where you can become properly soaked and miserable. Oh? This is not a place where rain is coming down, so... But instead of trees, you find yourself standing in front of a bank of computers. Shit, you misfired. Wait, you remember seeing a big structure off in the distance when you were in front of Rose's house. You figure it was just some sort of office building, but this looks more like a factory or a secret research lab. The computers show coordinates on a screen that don't mean anything to you. The countdown clock is frozen on 4.13. All of this has the trappings of a tableau someone set up for you to see. 
turning away from the screens, you wander down a long line of gleaming science fiction equipment. It reminds you of pictures of old computers from 1950s. The ones that took up entire rooms. You bet you could go back and visit some of those if you zapped hard enough. You wander through a whole maze of halls and wide, echoing rooms that aren't pictures because your art budget is only so big, but it take it as a certainty that they are all very mysterious. Eventually, you circle back to that strange bank of screens. Nervously, you hit a few keys, tap a few fingers against the readouts. Nothing. It's all locked down. You think that if you could only get these screens to unlock, you can unravel the secrets of life, the universe, and everything. Or maybe it's just your memories you are trying to unlock. Maybe. Then you'll understand the seething waters of this endless ocean of time and space intertwining in the- Meow. Uh, meow? Meow. You turn around expecting a cat, and you do get a cat, a very adorable black cat, and a tiny and soft, with far more eyes than a cat should have. Aww. But the cat isn't the only thing here. Oh, you're so cute. I love mom. A woman in a sleek white lab coat and sensible heels holds the cat, pinning you to the spot with her gaze. Or at least you assume she is. Her hair is in her eyes, and the light is behind her, so all you can see of her face are her painted lips. And her nose. Uh, sorry ma'am. You absolutely didn't mean to trespass in our secret science lab, and you actually aren't even lying. You really did just fuck up this time. The lady puts the cat down slowly, where it rolls on its back and bats paw playfully in the air. Aw, cats are so great. Even mutant cats, maybe. Especially mutant cats. Definitely mutant cats. This little guy should have a name. Hmm, you think you'll name him... Cryptid McWhiskers. Yeah, Cryptid McWhiskers. It is a great name. In fact, you can't imagine anyone ever naming this cat anything else. You hold out a hand to Cryptid McWhiskers and wriggle your fingers. It rolls back onto its feet and saunters over to you. It's so cute. <laughs> it is as soft and fluffy as it looks, and its four eyes blink up at you with utter trust. At least this kitty will be your friend. The ominous clack of heels and cement reminds you that you and Cryptid McWhiskers are not alone. While you were busy with the kitty cat, the very intimidating, well-coughed lady has walked over to the bank of screens. She presses a button, and it must have some sort of fingerprint recognition or retinal scanning, or maybe she's just better at things than you are because it works for her. On the floor a few feet from you, is a round gray protrusion, a platform on the floor. You saw it earlier, but you had no idea what it was for, so you just ignored it. What you don't understand can't hurt you, right? You think that's probably right? The intimidating lady presses a button on the screen, mouth turning up at the corners. A flash and a pop, like the pressure in the room changes, you feel it in your eardrums. A pumpkin appears on the round grave platform. Fuck. Hmm. You aren't really sure what she's trying to say here. Making a pumpkin appear out of thin air is impressive, but it is probably- it probably would have been more so if you hadn't been popping in and out of existence all day. It's gonna take more than a pumpkin to impress you. Pumpkin. What pumpkin? Oh no. The lady shakes her head and hits another button. The pumpkin vanishes and its place is a tiger. Yes, you heard that right. A whole ass tiger. Orange and black with big teeth and big claws. For a second or the two of you just look at each other. Honestly, the tiger might be more shocked than you are. 
Kinda sucks to think about one second you're just chilling out on the savannah, mauling antelopes and drinking at the watering hole, and the next you're in a secret lab in upstate New York, staring down a very unappetizing looking protagonist. Hey, they're in upstate New York? <laughs> Apparently you're appetizing enough for it to just want to get a taste. Oh geez, though, because it looks from you to cryptid McWhiskers and back again, then it charges. You try to book it out of there. The lady in the lab coat looms up in front of you. She's saying something. You strain to hear her. The tiger is right behind you. The lady or the tiger? At the last minute, you remember you have magic powers, and you choose the third option, teleporting the fuck out of there. Oh, not again. You just zapped into yet another unknown building, although from the view outside, you think you might be in Rose's house. Also, the fact that Rose turns the corner in the hallway and stops short, still in her rain gear. Her eyes are very wide. You wave awkwardly. Hi. That snaps her out of it. She stands up straight, sliding easily from shock to superiority. So you thought you'd just let yourself in? After wasting my time mumbling about the mail, a gaudy display of manipulative self recrimination and then popping out of existence to leave me asking myself if I'd finally lost my mind. You had meant to do any of that, especially not that last part. She isn't losing her mind, unless both of you are losing your minds together. Rose looks you over. Finally, she seems to decide that you are for real. Your predilectations toward mailman Mimicry weren't all that John told me about. Oh? He also said that you had certain powers. Powers of teleportation and time travel. I told him that he must be mistaken, since it's a well-known and accepted fact that, su that magic, although a popular and highly engaging subject of fiction, is fake as hell. Oh, your zappy powers? No, your... Those are totally real and not fake. Real in a different way than you being a mailman is real since it's actually made up. Okay, I think that this is just going on. It's gonna repeat itself. She's still got her umbrella open. Hey, doesn't she know that's bad luck? Luck is also fake as hell. You say you can do magic. Prove it. But she just saw you vanish out of her front yard. Like I said, I could be losing my mind. She could be losing it now, at the very minute, but you see no point in arguing. You hold out a hand, and after a moment of hesitation, Rose puts her fingers in yours. Her nails are long and sharp and painted a glossy black. She closes her eyes, and her umbrella droops. Should I picture my room or something similar? I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to work. She still thinks you're fucking with her. You tell her that you guess she can do that if she wants. Zip! When you open your eyes, you find her in a large, messy bedroom. Okay, so yeah. So that was that. Comment, like, subscribe if you want to see more that I've done. You can check the links in the description. Check my channel. Share the video if you liked it. And thank you for watching. Keep gaming.